Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, which is heat-related prevention best practices for employers. My name is Holly Foxworth. I'm a registered nurse. I'm the marketing manager for content. I don't know where you are, but here in Texas, we are in triple digit heat. So this topic definitely couldn't be timelier. Um, we're definitely seeing an increase in the number of heat related illness cases here at Axiom. And so our goal today really is to talk through and equip you with the necessary information, not only to protect yourself, but also to protect your team. So we're gonna be going through everything from prevention to recognizing and then also um, taking action. But we have an incredible lineup today. Um, lots of experts that are joining. We have Dr. Scott Cherry, he's our chief medical officer. We have Dara Wheeler, who is our chief marketing officer. And then we also have a special guest today, which is Marcus Kirk. He is the regional safety manager at Garney Construction. And so they all bring a wealth of knowledge and expertise you're gonna love hearing from them. But before we dive in, let's go ahead and get you acquainted to what you're looking at here on your screen, and then we'll get started. So there on the right-hand side of your screen, you'll notice that there's a blue box, and that one is for the next webinar that we have this next month. It has an RSVP button below that, and the topic is ready for anything tackling medical crisis at work. And that one's going to be on September the 12th at one o'clock p.m. Central. So we all know that medical emergencies, they come up out of nowhere, they can rise out of nowhere without warning. And so they can very quickly turn some of those ordinary days into crit uh, days needing critical action. So we, whether that be heart attacks, whether that be employees that are having a stroke, whether it's someone that becomes unconscious, um, even injuries, we wanna make for sure that, that you're prepared for those. So we're gonna be going through immediate response techniques, um, some of those life-saving measures before professional help arrives. We'll go through building cultures of preparedness. We'll go through some emergency protocols, and then we'll also go through some really interesting case studies. So I think that you'll really enjoy those. So those are real life scenarios from some of the top kind of, um, um, employers in the, in the nation there. So again, all you need to do to register for that event is click that button, and that will make for sure that your seat is reserved. As always, these events are recorded and we will make those available to you within 24 hours. We do have a copy of today's slide deck that's located right there at the bottom of your screen. You should see that along with some additional resources there. So I think that we have some um, heat related resources there. We even have one that talks about the, the relationship between mental illness and heat, heat illness. So that's very interesting as well. So you may wanna check those out. And then two final things, there's several ways for you to engage with us. They obviously have the emojis that you can use if there's something that really jumps out at you. But my personal favorite is using that Q&A box. And so that is how you can communicate with us. You can share any of your thoughts. You can ask us questions. You can share any of your stories, anything that you wanna put in there. That's the first place that I like to go when I, I send out gifts, thank you gifts from some of these events. I read everything that you put in there. Um, um, we all do, and so we, that is very important to us. That's the first place that we go. So definitely make for sure that you utilize that, that and don't be surprised if you get something in the mail from me afterwards. Um, finally, it was great to see a lot of you at ASSP this last week um, there in Denver. And we also wanted to mention that this next month, we're going to be at the National Safety Council. So that one is going to be in Orlando, Florida. So if you need free expo passes for all three days, make sure just drop your name in the chat there and let us know that you need an expo pass and we will make for sure that we get one of those to you. So we would love to see you there. All right, well, let's go ahead and meet our presenters. Um, Dr. Cherry, we'll start with you, followed by Dara, and then we'll go on to Marcus. Dr. Cherry? Yep, thanks, Holly. My name is Scott Cherry. I'm Axiom Medical's Chief Medical Officer. My professional background is I'm board certified in preventive medicine, public health, and occupational environmental medicine. And I've been supporting uh, the US government, the military, and uh, corporate industrial operations for the past uh, 20 years. And it's a pleasure to be with you. Awesome, thank you. How about you, Dara? Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Dara Wheeler. I'm Axiom Chief Marketing Officer. Uh, this is my 18th year with Axiom, supporting our clients in um, various <clears throat> formats. I'm really excited for this conversation. Um, I do think it'll be a really interesting one, especially given how hot it is right now in mm -hmm. this South Texas region. Absolutely. Thank you, Marcus. Hi, uh, thanks for the invite, Holly. I, I appreciate it. Um, my name is Marcus Kirk, 
and um, I'm a regional safety manager with Garney Construction. Been working in the industry and I've felt all y'all's pain here, born and bred here in South Texas myself, South, South Central Texas and um, 30 years in the environment and excited to be here. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us. We're thrilled to have all three of you. Before we get started with kind of going through the discussion topics, we do have a poll question to put up and I'll kind of make this a two-parter actually. So we'll ask you this one first, which is approximately how many how many employees do you think suffer from heat-related illnesses or injuries each year? Do you think that's 10,000? Do you think it's 30,000? Do you think it's 40,000? And then the second part of that is, why don't you let us know where you are located and what the weather conditions are where you're at um, and whether you've seen an increase of, of heat related cases there as well. So while you guys are taking care of that, we'll go through our discussion topics that we have. So we're gonna be going through not only the key indicators of, of heat related illness, but we're also gonna be going through <clears throat> risk factors. We'll go through some prevention strategies um, hit some first aid and emergency response measures, really focus on employer best practices, and then also talk about the new proposed OSHA standards that are going to be coming up there. All right, well, let's take a look at the poll and see how see where we stand here. Cheryl, Cheryl mentioned that she's from Central Florida and it's very been very hot and humid there as well. Dara, what's our answer here? So looks like we've got a little and I'll <coughs> give away the answer. Here, I think you may be what there. I think you may be breaking up just a little bit. Could you say it one more time? Oh, I apologize. I don't know. I seem to be glitching a little bit. Mm. I just said, uh, it looks like we're evenly split between 30 and 40,000. Yeah, yeah. So I think that we are, the official estimate that came from, from OSHA was about 40,000. So about 40,000 every single year um, is what's going on with um, with the number of people that, that are suffering from heat-related illnesses um, within their workplaces. So we're getting, getting some great answers here. Lots of people that are chiming in. Um, Jasmine's from North Texas, it's 102 there, bless your heart. Um, also from New Orleans, very hot there. Um, Ron, South Texas as well, so lots of good answers. Um, we appreciate we appreciate your responses there. And if you're having some heat-related illness cases, um, tell us about those as well. We'd love to go through those with you. All right, well, Dr. Cherry, let's jump into heat-related illnesses and talk us through the different types that, that are associated with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, you know, over the decades, I think um, the way uh, the medical community has characterized or um, categorized heat illness, um, I think here we have the classic examples, which I kind of like, but in, in some regards, they've moved to more of a continuum of just heat illness going from less severe to more severe. But I, I think this helps our audience think of it as buckets of severity. Um, <laughs> however, uh, this, this slide presupposes heat cramps is on the mild side, but you can really have very, very severe heat cramps that really uh, render you useless uh, because your muscles are spasming, uh, you know, almost uh, to the limit, I would say. So, um, but I want to point out heat stroke is really the medical emergency here. So I'll, I'll kind of hammer it a few times, but the way you can distinguish heat stroke from all of the others or when to know it's truly a medical emergency is when there's a change in mental status. And that's really the fancy way of saying when someone's personality dramatically changed. So they're no longer interacting with, with, with others or the environment appropriately. They're not, they're not answering questions appropriately and things like that. And so usually a doctor will ask like person, place and time, you know, um, what's your name, where are you and what's the date and you will get very bizarre answers. And so that should really indicate you know, no longer do you treat this kind of as first aid and, and, and that there's time to respond that you really should make this, you know, a medical emergency. Um, you know, so getting back to kind of the beginning of the continuum, some people may never get heat cramps on this uh, on, when they're um, 
heat stress and, and, and actually have a heat illness. But, um, you know, you start out with some electrolyte imbalances and you'll notice some spasms uh, transiently. And then you may really go into like a full muscle spasm that really prevents movement altogether. Um, and I think what most people experience is heat exhaustion where they've been sweating a lot. Um, and then uh, based on just the duration and how much um, exertion they're, they're performing, they will get more and more tired um, to where they get you know, really lightheaded and fainting. And then um, also vomiting is kind of an interesting uh, kind of general symptom but um, really, when you continue uh, maybe in hot temperatures or performing the same amount of work, you can go into what is called heat stroke, which your body temperature can no longer be regulated. And so your, your, your body temperature can, can get up to like 103, like if you have a fever, you really kind of lose the ability to sweat. And so that's why you're, you know, you've essentially run out of water that can be converted into sweat. And uh, then you have, again, mental status changes with confusion, loss of consciousness, possibly, you know, your heart rate is gonna be beating fast to make up for, uh, to try to keep your blood pressure up because you've lost so much volume. And really this is the medical emergency. And um, Marcus, I don't know if you have, kind of are seeing this, you know, in real time, at some of your work sites, but be interesting to, to see your point of view, uh, uh, in, uh, you know, on the ground. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, uh, right now, at, coming out of the month of July, which um, in Texas, we had an extremely wet month, actually, in July, mm -hmm. but historically, you know, July and, July and August are always pretty bad. So, I mean, um, heat is always a factor. Um, but not only, not only do we have issues with the heat, but also it, it's, it's a, um, it's a secondary root cause to, to a lot of other incidents resulting in complacency and frustration and things mm -hmm. like that. Um, usually, usually August is, is a very dry month and it's a highly productive month. We've got more hours in the day. Um, and, it's, it's extremely productive on the good, on the, on the pro side, but I, the, the cons is, is definitely the heat. Um, we, we, we've seen an, an uptick specifically in our incidents revolving heat stress on Monday afternoons and really? through the investigation process, a lot of that was stemming from, you know, how employees took care of themselves, um, the, the weekend prior. Um, we had an uptick coming right out of the July 4th weekend um, where we had an uptick on that Monday. Um, but it, um, it, it's frustration that, that we all share in construction dur during these months, especially for, for outdoor activities. And it's, it's, um, it's, it's an ongoing everyday thing for us to make sure that, that uh, we're staying proactive and, you know, hydrating and, and all that. The most alarming thing that I saw was definitely the Monday afternoon was was about 75% of our heat related incidents was mm -hmm. was on a Monday afternoon. Hmm. Um, yeah, that's interesting. Uh, in some ways, I, I know heat stress can be cumulative. So sometimes we like to give the example of, you know, someone's worked, you know, is working Monday through Friday and earlier in the week, it's hotter and actually Fridays when they manifest their heat injury, even when it's maybe a cooler day, but there's kind of this cumulative approach where you never get fully recovered from day to day. So it's, yeah. you're, you're taking a, a loss, cumulative losses uh, day to day. But I think you raise a great point of, you, you almost have, you know, athletes have to prehydrate before a big event. And um, a lot of employees uh, out there are really kind of working athletes, especially if they're doing physically demanding work in, in, in the hot environment. And so if their weekend uh, behaviors per perhaps uh, take away some of that resilience, whether they're, you know, um, 
not hydrating enough. Alcohol really does dehydrate the body. Um, alcohol, you know, our kidneys filter our blood and create urine and uh, regulate our body uh, water and um, mineral content and our blood pressure. And alcohol directly turns off one of the last functions of the kidney to um, bring bring back in water if we need it before it becomes urine. And so, uh, um, you know, alcohol is especially susceptible to making people uh, heat, uh, uh, susceptible to heat injury. And I know we'll talk about some other risk factors on the next slide, but I, I think your point about a holiday, after any weekend or especially a holiday weekend may, may be higher risk. Absolutely. We had Sean that had mentioned as well. That's what he said was too much alcohol consumption over the weekend. So definitely there's some others that, that are seeing the same things. We had some other comments that came in as well. Um, Justin Lopez had said, was talking about behavior changes can be seen with that body fluid loss. Um, and he was talking about that study. Some of the studies has shown that 2% or more of the body weight fluid loss um, causes some of those behavioral changes. And so he was asking, mm -hmm. is this the same severity as behavior changes seen with a heat stroke? Yep, exactly. And I, I missed the percentage that you said, Holly. Um, um, I think he said much? about 2% or more um, of, oh, yeah. of the body weight fluid loss. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so he was asking, are some of those behavior changes seen with a heat stroke? Exactly. Yep. Yeah, and you know, you you lose just physical performance uh, capability. So, I, you know, Marcus, I heard you say several times about frustration because you have the opportunity um, just because of more daylight, things like that. It usually there's less rain, so the the company and the employees are excited to be able to do a lot of work. And as you actually, uh, you know, when we think about it for athletes, if if they weigh themselves after their workout session, if if they're five or eight, if they're eight pounds lighter, they've lost a gallon of, of internal water. And so they probably lost 20% of their physical strength because they're, they're so dehydrated. And so, um, you know, and then as that persists, then you do have potential mental status changes too. Absolutely. We also had Ron that had mentioned that he had actually had a heat stroke back in the 90s. He said that um, he was hauling hay. Luckily, there was a creek that was close by. And he was able to get in the mm -hmm. cool water and calm down rapidly. But one one point that he, he made that I thought makes so much sense is that ever since then that he's noticed that heat really affects him very quickly so ever since that event had occurred. Well, so, yeah. you, you, you know, his example actually was something I think we talked about perhaps last year on this topic or one of the, one of the last years we, we brought this up. But in the military, um, if you have a true heat stroke, it's really a medical board. Um, you usually will no longer stay in the military because the, uh, they found once you have one heat stroke, you're much more sensitive to have sub subsequent heat strokes. They're, there's something that changes in the physiology. It, it, it's almost like your physiology is scarred is probably the easiest way to put it. Um, but it, it really is a concern in the military. And I know that that, you know, if a young soldier gets heat stroke, it, it really can shorten their career. Um, we haven't probably talked about it that much here, but it's great to hear that example of feeling always sensitive to heat stress. Absolutely. Well, let's talk about some of those risk factors. I see if there's uh, several questions that have came in that, that kind of relate to some of these risk factors, but this is really where it gets kind of tricky. So Dr. Cherry, talk us through some of these mm -hmm. that, that really kind of put us at risk of having some of those heat related events. Yeah, and you know, as I think about kind of dealing with this topic over almost 20 years now, you know, in some ways it seems like this doesn't necessarily go away. And I think there's clear risk, uh, you know, overt, very, uh, very clear risk factors, but I think there's a lot of subtle risk factors. And and so the ones that are kind of well-established is temperature. Um, and it, it's not just temperature, but also humidity. And uh, it's also um, basically how long have you been in that type of exposure? So some type of, you know, being acclimatized to that. And so what happens a lot of times is people are hired and maybe you know they're hired in one location but travel to another location that's much hotter or much more humid or they're just not used to being in the heat even if they're in really good shape and so 
again, high, high temperatures and humidity can really, um, and it, it's acute and chronic, right? So um, it depends on how long you've been exposed to that. And, um, you know, health conditions can really um, alter someone's ability, their physiology to, you know, throw off heat, kind of like, a you know, everyone knows in a car they have a radiator. And so it's the radiator's job to radiate heat from the engine. And so our circulatory system is part of that. And um, if you have any type of um, cardiovascular issues, that that affects your um, ability to offset heat. Um, you know, so heart disease, diabetes affects circulation um, at the at the small vessels, the capillaries where the heat exchange actually occurs. A lot of heat exchange goes um, from your palms and your soles, and um, you know, also age. So very young and older are much more vulnerable to um, uh, heat stress, a young, young, uh, or young and small persons are, they have a much smaller, uh, total body volume of blood and therefore, um, fluid. And so when they lose some, uh, water or, or through sweat, um, the percentage is much higher than what would be like a, a fully grown, uh, adult. Um, and then medications are really subtle, you know, even just taking like, uh, some allergy medicines can dramatically impair heat regulation. Um, you know, if you're on blood pressure medicines, um, just most, a, a lot of medications really affect the body's ability to, um, uh, allow, um, allow the body to, re you know, regulate heat. And so, you know, you can almost have a, a medical surveillance program just to kind of ensure medications aren't putting people at high, <clears throat> at high risk for um, heat stress. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know, speaking about the medications, Dara, I don't know if you want to talk about some of the medication reviews, some of those options on, you know, the um, disadvantage sometimes that people have on on not knowing that that some of their employees are are taking some of these medications and put them at an increased risk are are you able to hear me okay now My internet yeah. Yeah, okay um so yeah holly's right it's interesting people often ask especially very experienced safety individuals why you have medical involved and one of the key areas is understanding mm -hmm. I mean, the interactions of med medication. Oh, am I cutting out again? I can hear you okay. Okay. Um, the things when we review cases to determine heat-related illness is review those medications somebody is on so that, that we under can help guide the conversation. And, yeah, from a could be affecting their status at work. Absolutely. Marcus, I was going to ask you about, you know, how do you guys handle that, you know, from a safety perspective um, there with your some of your construction employees? Um, you know, do you guys take into account some of the medications that they may be on and, and how do you manage that from a medical perspective? Well, that's um that's kind of hard. I mean, yeah, you, yeah. You, you might be a little bit more of, of the authority there as far as HIPAA laws and that kind of stuff, but we got to be real careful with that. Mm -hmm. um, we, we do ask that our employees um, put relevant um, information in their hard hat, you know, whether they're allergic to bees or insulin dependent or things like that, that's volunteer only. Mm -hmm. But as far as day-to-day -day medications, um, that kind of stuff, you know, it it it, it does limit us, you know, in, right. on construction sites. Absolutely, um, you know, that is one of the things that that we do is we're able to provide um, some of these medication reviews. Um, 
you know, by having the the employees speak with the with the medical professional, and we just kind of keep keep track of those and make for sure that the medications that they're on that that those they are able to safely perform their regular duties. But I really love what you said about about putting some of those um, warnings within their hard hat. That makes so much sense, and I've never heard that recommendation before. But that that's fantastic. Um, we did have some other questions. Ron was uh, Ron Smith had mentioned that he asked employees to volunteer um, any medications that um, they may be on and was asking uh, Dr. Cherry if you wanted to speak to how HIPAA falls into that and, and um, the protected health information. Right, and you know, I, I definitely can understand your 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 position, uh, Marcus, and, and I think every employer is there where they know they can't directly ask um, for the company knowing um, because there is that privacy, uh, you know, we want to have an insulation there. Um, you know, so um, in some ways we think about it as fitness for duty. So there are some job categories that if they have medical requirements, then it's very easy, right? Like you send them for a DOT, DOT physical or um, a pilot physical or, you know, um, material handling physical for like forklift and things like that. It, it's kind of a gray area with um, heat stress, right? Like uh, we, we will talk about it later on about potentially there's an OSHA standard, but there isn't one now. So, you know, we're, we're you know, we're kind of left up to kind of best practices without, um, you know, violating uh, the employee's privacy. But what I would say is if, if a company is noticing a huge um, number of heat injuries, um, they could look into getting what's called a, a medical surveillance program for heat stress to where, um, you know, the employer doesn't know the personal medical history, but their employees are screened and educated about uh, their medications they're taking, medical, uh, medical conditions uh, to really, you know, provide primary and secondary prevention for heat stress. Um, you know, so that's something I think is on a case by case basis. If, 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 a, if a population of employees is experiencing high, high levels of, you know, heat injuries and um, the, the company's doing everything that we're gonna talk about in the next slide and it's not mm -hmm. helping as much, you know, cause you know, I think decades ago, you know, uh, prescription medications are becoming much more common across, you know, every age group. I, I forget now um, the average age of prescriptions, but I, I think it's like between one and and five, depending on your, your, your age group. So uh, undoubtedly, as you get multiple medications, the chances of those medications affecting your ability to um, manage heat, you know, manage heat is, is going to go higher and higher. So, um, I, I think again, if you, if you have good data and you can show it to, uh, management that, Hey, we're having too many heat injuries, let's look into getting some medical surveillance programs to, to educate, but also screen for higher risk medications. You know, you can almost recommend other medications sometimes and, and things like that. So. Dr. Cherry, um, James had asked specifically what what types of medications affect heat stress most. I know that you had mentioned some of the allergy medications, but did you want to go into some of the others? Maybe some of the some of the behavioral health meds and et cetera. Yeah. So, um, and I think one of the biggest ones is a uh, high blood pressure medicine. It, it, a lot of times, uh, people are on diuretics and. Um, Sometimes they're the first line, uh, the first things doctors go for to treat high blood pressure, uh, like hydrochlorothiazide or Lasix. And so that basically turns your kidney on uh, more than it would be in a, w without the medication. And so you're, you're actually losing water and electrolytes uh, kind of just sitting there. So when you actually get into heat stress, that's a huge issue um, and you know, we've been talking about mental health now for, you know, several years. And um, so a lot of the medications to treat all the all of the um, mental health um, uh, diagnoses do to a degree affect the ability of the body's the, the body's ability to um, manage um you know, uh, heat stress, and it's it's more as as the medications are um, changing the chemistry in the brain. 
um, our hypothalamus is actually um, kind of the master regulator of uh, homeostasis, which is trying to keep, you know, your electrolytes and your water volume um, at some kind of balance. And so we do see that with a lot of the different medications for mental health that people are much more susceptible as well. Um, and then, uh, you know, so heart disease and di diabetes are some of the most common uh, diagnoses, diagnoses in our in the country and in the, in the world. And so whether it's from the medical condition or the medications, you have kind of this negative synergist synergy that affects um, the ability for the body to handle, um, you know, heat. So, you know, it, it's a very complex, you know, there's so many medications out there. So it's really good to um, almost access an expert when it comes to it. it. It'd be hard to list every medication, right? So, but, you know, the most common medical conditions are associated with medications that do affect um, that heat regulation uh, ability of ours. Absolutely. I saw that there were some great questions that came in about some of the energy drinks, et cetera. So let's talk about, um, let's talk uh, about some of those, those prevention strategies. I think we yeah. may be able to get into those um, right here. So talk us through those. Yes, you know, the energy drinks remind me of my time in the military where they were banning them <laughs> uh, even stateside, let alone during deployment, uh, just because, you know, uh, caffeine does really um, uh, affect, it, it, it's a natural diuretic, kind of like we were talking about with, um, uh, with the blood pressure medications. However, caffeine does bring your blood pressure up and it, it, it actually constricts your blood vessels, which raises your blood pressure. And so when you raise your blood pressure, your kidney says, hey, there's too much fluid in the system. We got to purge. And so you have a what is called a pressure diuresis, which really makes the kidney turn on th kind of through a pressure feedback. And, um, you know, so, you know, looking at prevention strategies, you do want to drink fluids, but probably stay away from the energy drinks. Um, and then we did speak about alcohol already. So, you know, try to avoid alcohol and caffeine. Uh, I've, 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 I've interviewed employees that sometimes have six or 12 energy drinks in a shift if they're on shift work. And so that's not great for you for many reasons, but it, it definitely will kind of lead you up to a high risk for heat stress if, if you had to do an emergency response, things like that too. So. I always tell employers, it's not your common functions, but it's your essential functions you have to be ready for. So, you know, emergency response can be tough because it's very quiet until it isn't, you know, and it's hard to predict. But, you know, you can prehydrate with just plain water, but if you're, if you're sweating a lot, you're losing a lot of electrolytes too. So it's good to, you know, drink water, but also drink uh, water with some electrolytes. It doesn't have to be necessarily with sugar, but with sodium and potassium and, and maybe magnesium, things like that. Um, and then with your clothing makes a huge difference. In fact, I have t-shirts that I call now my winter t-shirts and my summer t-shirts. I, I can feel a dramatic difference just with a t-shirt. So you, you kind of want to make sure what you're wearing is, is breathing very freely and just because it's a t-shirt doesn't mean it's kind of uh, going to do that for you. Um, but I'm sure there's commercial products available that are really made for that. And I, I've noticed myself just having to wear lighter colors uh, to get away from, you know, usually the darker colors like black will actually absorb heat and things like that. Um, and I think one of the most important things is uh, a acclim acclimation to the environment. So again, new employees are usually at very high risk, especially if they're new to, to the work and the location. Sometimes you're hiring well-experienced people, but if, if they're coming from a cool climate and then they're going to, you know, West Texas, even though they're experienced. So it's, again, it's about experience of the, the work, but then also of the environment. So you could actually kind of slowly grade someone up over time where maybe they spend an, you know an hour in the hot environment and then an hour doing something that 
potentially that can be done in more cool, cool areas and just slowly grade them up over a week to three weeks would really set them up for success. Um, and so those are really the big prevention strategies, uh, you, you know, yeah. that I can think of. Absolutely. And Marcus, I, I'm anxious to hear what you have to say when we get to employers best practices, because I, I know that you must deal with this one a lot. Um, Dr. Cherry, we did have Justin that had asked, how closely would you recommend employees focus on rehydrating with electrolytes and sodium as opposed to just focusing on getting water to those employees? So, um, you know, if someone's already getting, if they're already symptomatic, I, I would prefer them to do the electrolytes because they've already lost um, a, a lot of uh, fluid and electrolytes. and there's actually this, um, how would I describe it? So if you're only drinking plain water, uh, what can happen is as you're sweating, the, the only way your body can create sweat is by secreting sodium through your pores. That's why if you've ever tasted your, your skin from sweating, it's very salty. But what happens over time as you're sweating a lot, your sodium levels dropping, dropping, dropping. And if you're just drinking water, your your sodium's getting even more diluted in your blood and so um you can actually drink too much plain water and that can actually cause an issue as well because then you start having to pee just plain water and for for you to pee you still actually have to excrete sodium so sodium is kind of the currency of <laughs> uh, fluid management in your body so once you're really sweating you really need to do electrolytes um, and then even preparing beforehand. Um, and so I hope that answers his question. Yeah. yeah. One more quick question before we move on to, um, to the emergency response and the first aid was Peter had said some of our employees that work out a lot have said that um, creatine helps them to work in the heat. And he was asking, is that a real thing? Are you aware? <sighs> um. I'm not aware of creatine helping. Um, that's a great question. I'm very curious, actually, because creatine is one of the most highly studied supplements, and uh, yeah. it's more of a personal interest of mine than a professional. But <laughs> I know it, it's 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 been well studied, and although I don't, I'm not giving you know advice individually here, but um, it's usually. I haven't seen studies that have shown negative effects. It, it's usually very positive. Um, I just, in the context of, of heat stress, I'm not sure if it's shown to be helpful or not, but it's usually been shown to be helpful for almost any other uh, situation. <laughs> so mm -hmm. interesting. Yeah, absolutely. One more, um, Jennifer was asking, how do moisture wicking fabrics affect fluid loss and dehydration? And do they promote dehydration or are they helpful? You, you know, so I think that, you know, that's a really great question. Um, you know, so the, the way our body is losing um, heat is it's, it's bringing water to the surface of our skin. And then, um, you know, how like an ice cube goes from it melts so it, it's it's losing it's a it, it, it's a absorbing heat from the environment and so that's what's happening on your skin is your skin um, is bringing water to the surface and then that water is a, absorbing heat from your body and then it, it kind of evaporates away and so if you if you've ever worked in low humidity I used to live in uh, West Texas uh, like El Paso and New Mexico area and um, there's such low humidity that when you get out of the shower, you're literally freezing uh, when I first <laughs> moved there because the water is evaporating off your skin so quickly. In fact, most air con a lot of the old school air conditioners are just water evaporative coolants. They have no Freon or anything like that. So, um, you know, the, 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 the heat wicking ability, it kind of prolongs that evaporation process. So I, I think it's a good thing necessarily, but yeah. sometimes it may not work for everyone as well. Everyone is kind of individual, yeah. but it also provides a layer of barrier for direct convection of heat to the skin. Agree, agree. Um, talk us through the first aid and emergency responses for each of these, because they 
they're very similar, but some of them are very different when it comes to the urgency of, of things that you would need to do. So talk us through what the difference would yeah. be between the heat ramps, the exhaustion, and also a heat stroke. Mm -hmm. And just like when I described these uh, buckets of severity, I, I, I wanted to focus on the most concerning one first, so heat stroke. So in the military, we call it bottom line up front. So w whenever you notice a change in mental status, a change in personality, a change in how someone is answering questions and they're not answering questions appropriately, you know, that's heat stroke, that's a medical emergency, so you should call 911 immediately. And, um, you know, for, so, so that's the big differentiator. Like heat stroke is really a very concerning, uh, um, it, it's the most concerning aspect of this topic However, the, the, you know, the, you know, for the all three, once you call 911 for heat stroke, you, you do the same thing for the other three, for, for the three. So you always move someone out of the, the exposure. So usually the exposure is direct heat. Um, so you want to move them to a cooler location and you want them to uh, rest because as we're doing physical activity, our muscles are generating a fair amount of heat. So you, you want to basically remove the external heat source and the internal heat source. Uh, so then, um, uh, you know, everyone, you want them to start um, drinking water as soon as possible. And, um, you know, so for heat cramps on top of that, they're gonna start cramping up pretty badly if it's true heat cramps. And so trying to sh have, help them stretch will be helpful. Um, for heat exhaustion, um, really it's kind of the same thing. They may not have cramps, but really oral rehydration. So just drinking water and uh, electrolyte solutions can usually kind of remedy both heat cramps and heat exhaustion. Um, the tricky part again though is, you know, is it just kind of garden variety heat exhaustion or is it someone with significant past medical history and medications that are kind of going to delay the recovery process extensively to where first aid uh, or, or just coworkers may start feeling uncomfortable managing this. And so, um, and then again, just with heat stroke, once you notice those mental status changes, call 911 immediately uh, remove move them to a cooler location try to get them um, tr try to cool them off as best as possible and again if they potentially are going to lose consciousness then you don't want to force uh, you know fluids at that time absolutely we did have one question from Daniel that was asking um, I heard that you should give ice water as first aid and was asking was that true I think he's speaking to the temperature of the water do you have an opinion on that yeah, I do, and um, I think this is the art of uh, medicine to a degree. So I think in general, giving fluids is 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 really needed. Um, I probably still would prefer cool fluids versus freezing fluids, and that's also when it comes to uh, like heat exhaustion or heat stroke. Like we've heard of doing ice baths and ice under the armpits and neck and things like that, and. That's still in practice, but I, I think where most emergency responders are, are, are heading to is more uh, lukewarm water uh, with evaporative fans over it. There's evaporative beds, things like that. So um, one interesting thing with, with ice water is when we drink really cold water, that almost can trick parts of our brain thinking we're cooler than we are. And so it actually starts relaxing some of the um, heat regulatory mechanisms because it's saying, oh, I, I've got 40 degrees in my throat <laughs> and down my esophagus. Yeah. And it's really like, you know, 100 degrees, you know. So um, I do a lot of long distance uh, cycling and a lot of the cyclists like to put like ice bags on their back and drink you know, ice water and, and I, even in that setting, um, it's probably not helping them as much as it's helping them more psychologically than physiologically. And I think that's kind of an extension to employees, how, how we're talking here. 
But yeah. um, if you only have ice water, I think that's fine too. Yeah. But uh, I wouldn't overly seek that as well. Yeah. yeah. Well, let's talk about some employer best practices. And Marcus, I'm really, I'm really interested in what you have to say about some of these, and especially some of the things that, that you're doing to educate your staff. Um, do you want to talk us through some of these and some of the some of the strategies that you guys are using there on construction sites? Absolutely. So, I mean, one of the most important things is you start these conversations with new employees on day one. Mm -hmm. um, you start indoctrinating the employee and 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 teaching them about you know the the scope of work we're doing and and um, the different ways to prevent prevent injury. Um, uh, we also educate our staffs on how to manage uh, heat related heat related incidents as well. Um, we we also uh, almost every training that we do that that's highly specialized to. To, to our type of construction is, you know, the different, the different trainings as far as trenching and excavation, um, confined space entry, all of those specific trainings do have an element of, of climate and inclement weather. And probably 75% of the emphasis is always on heat, just based on where we are in the United States. Um, we, we also have uh, what we communicate on 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 a boots on the ground level as far as the guys actually performing the work. And we also have another layer above that, um, which would be more salary staff, but our our um, our medical uh, our medical management. Um, I, and I, I think that that's a lot of times what I see in the construction industry is the, the warning signs are there early and then people have what what we call in the construction industry the John Wayne syndrome you know it's mm -hmm. we, we've got 10 more minutes and, and we're going to be done and and they want to push through it you know just yeah. re-emphasize re we're, we're not storming the beaches in Normandy here we're, we're, we're trying <laughs> to get a job complete and um, get it complete with with the, the end result being that everyone go, goes home safe you know, at the end of the day. Um, well, another thing that we put a real heavy emphasis on is our is our daily um, job safety analysis. I know everyone calls it something different and it's always uh, mm -hmm. uh, a unique acronym. Here we call it the stack card. Um, some people call it the JSA. Uh, there's other companies that call it PTP, but it's basically the same function. It's it's whenever you start work in the morning, before you start work, you list out the scope of work that you're going to get accomplished for the day. And then all the hazards associated with that scope and then your mitigation strategies for each scope in, in mm -hmm. independently. Um, we do add another couple layers to that, uh, sp specifically when we reach 80 degrees or above, um, here with the here with Garney Construction, uh, we implement a heat card, and that also sits with with the stack card, and and we we pinpoint a different response to after eighty, after ninety, and then um, we have responses to that that the employees have to sign off on and understand completely, and then on that card, um, there's also the the QR code for for the NIOSH. Um, the NIOSH uh, heat safety tool. And they're able to, to pinpoint an hour by hour, you know, what kind of temperatures they're gonna be dealing with, not just temperatures, but index. And the index is is probably the most crucial thing, like like we were talking about earlier in different parts of the of the country. Um, the humidity is, is one of the biggest stressors that we have here in South Texas, but um, we, we have a different action level for 80 to 90, 91 to 103, 104 to 124, and then 125 plus. There's a, there's an action for for every time that that those colors change throughout the day, and we also communicate that with heat flags that represent the color of of those different uh, temperatures in or in heat index actually. Um, uh, 
Uh, we also communicate he heavily the hierarchies of controls whenever we're talking mm -hmm. about the mitigation factors and, and all those different mitigation strategies. Um, yeah. uh, we, we start with substitution. We always want to substitute yeah. or eliminate the hazards. Naturally, in the month of August, that is a very hard thing to do is eliminate that. You could say, well, we'll just do it at midnight tonight instead of noon today. You're not really eliminating anything. You are you are reducing the 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 different indexes of temperature naturally, but you're not really mm -hmm. eliminating them. Um, mm -hmm. Some engineering controls would be some fans, some some movements of air. Um, things, things of that nature. Um, mm -hmm. The administrative controls would be, um, you know, uh, work rotation. You know, why, why mm -hmm. would we have a guy in a trench working in a in a six foot metal trench box um, for twelve hours a day by himself? Get a get a job rotation, rotate them in hourly. You know, um, all, all those different yeah. kind of factors. And again, back to the heat flags and, and that kind of stuff. That's another administrative. Mm -hmm. uh, control when you're talking talking about the hierarchy of controls, um, yeah. PPE when you're talking about your clothing, um, I, it, some people are very unaware of. You, you start asking questions in orientation, they come in wearing something that you and I might wear, wear in the fall. You know, on a brisk day when it's 60 degrees outside, something thick mm -hmm. and cotton. Um, we really mm -hmm. emphasize the, the fish, the fishing type shirts with the UV protection where, where they have skin coverage, you know, hundred um, percent. We have um, uh, head protection that goes around the hard hat. that kind of mm -hmm. provides a little bit of shade. Um, we, we, this is heavily, heavily communicated on their first day. Mm -hmm. And then we That's also awesome. have additional communications in, in weekly toolboxes, especially building up through July and August, August months. Um, I love we that also, about the temper talks. Yeah, that makes it. Those are huge in, in terms perfect. of getting some education there. Yeah, and then and then the creation of safety committees. Um, you know, district or regional safety committees where where you you bring in the employees and they get to, you know, they they have a lot of insight. They're, they're the they're the yeah. boots on the ground people. They're the ones that really, you know, that that are feeling the the heat stressors out there and, you know, incorporate them into those teams of making decisions. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, it's a, it's, it's uphill battle. You can't ever let your guard down. You have to <laughs> stay, stay yeah. on top of it. Um, uh, my part in that is, of course, is, is implementing a, a lot, a lot of these strategies, but, but also seeing that they're followed through, you know, yeah. checking, going out in the field, observing, making sure that, that everyone's everyone's following suit and everybody's pulling the the rope in the in the same direction. You know, making sure we're Absolutely. taking care of our employees. Yeah, Dara, I was going to ask you. Um, you know, whenever we talk about from a practicality standpoint, and you know, it's like we all have policies and procedures, but sometimes things go off the rails. You know, it's like nobody. Um, Sometimes the policy may be there that that you know you're supposed to call when when something's immediately recognized, but then it doesn't occur. Talk to us about the example that we had that that really showed the difference between whenever it's managed appropriately versus um, what that outcome is when it goes it goes south. We've had a few case studies recently. Um, we have a traditional one that we talk about that was a client a few years ago that had two employees the same day with um, heat related illness symptoms. One employee called us, we were able to implement first aid recommendations, get them taken care of immediately, um, rem remotely over the phone. And then the other employee went to the emergency room and ended up getting IV fluids and missing work. Um, and the difference in cost was significant as well as, you know, obviously some other OSHA concerns. And either way, the employees got taken care of, but one, the employee ended up staying productive on the, the work site. Um, we're, we are running a campaign right now. It's called What Would Axiom Do? And so um, we've had a lot of you jump in with some scenarios here in the chat, so thank you. We will definitely get back with you on some feedback <coughs> regarding these scenarios. Um, the What Would Axiom Do scenarios, we are uh, encouraging 
kind of a, a stump the nurse scenario. So we have amazing experts like Holly and Dr. Cherry talking um, with employers about best practice and how we can kind of help manage some of these scenarios. Sometimes, sometimes they are very complicated um, and they involve various departments, HR, legal, safety, risk. It's not just a single threaded issue, um, but we actually had two submissions this month from employers uh, that work with Axiom about heat. Um, and in both cases, they ended up with signs and symptoms that came across almost more um, either uh, substance use or abuse or mental health yeah. symptoms. Like Dr. Cherry said, sometimes these heat related illnesses present as something that you might not immediately associate with mm -hmm. heat, like confusion and um, lack of response. So that yeah. was really interesting to us. Um, on one of the cases, there was on-site medical, and the on-site medical went through the scenario and, and basically said that they didn't feel that it was work-related and that it was personal mental health-related. And so we've been working through these scenarios and giving feedback. Um, if you follow us on social media, you'll see some videos that we'll post um, giving some of these responses to these scenarios because they've been very interesting to, to work through. So if you're somebody that wants to try to stump one of our experts, definitely submit a what would Axiom do to the marketing team and we'll uh, submit it to our experts and give you a response. So thank you. Absolutely. Yeah, I think we may take some of the some of the questions that we've had in here today. There's been some great ones that have came up, so I think that we may utilize some of those. Um, Marcus, I want to get to you and and have you actually kind of talk us through what we can expect with some of these proposed OSHA changes. I know we only have a few minutes left, but I wanted to see if you could really kind of bring up some of the highlights, some of the bigger pieces that that uh, may be a little bit different than what we have traditionally anticipated. Well, I mean. Um... I think some somebody in the chat, I believe his name was Jason, kind of did 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 highlight some. Um, he he made a comment about about um, that there's just even though we don't have anything currently, it, it is it is a it is proposed to be rolling out, but we do have we do have some state um, like Cal OSHA. Um, I know Washington, Washington, um, Oregon, and uh, Minnesota all have state plans that have already identified this standard. So we we do have something that we can we can kind of kind of go by. And um, I've been reviewing them, and th there's very few very few things that's going to surprise me. Being that I've I've had a lot of engagement with with uh, the California teams, but um, you know July second. Um, OSHA published an advanced copy of the, the proposed uh, federal heat standard, um, and whenever it's it's finally finally published, we have 120 days uh, to comment. Um, it'll cover it'll cover outdoor and indoor work settings and environments. Uh, it's gonna it's gonna require um, companies to have uh, an HIIPP plan which is heat injury and illness prevention plan and uh, the appointment of a heat safety coordinator. That was something whenever I was going through it that, um, that um, I was kind of surprised by, but not really. Um, the, the two, two heat triggers, uh, the temperatures are going to be um, 80 degrees and 90 degrees. Um, the access for water and shade, uh, the, the incur encouragement or requirement of um, uh, breaks, um, there's there's a whole a whole lot of uh, training that's that's into these and um, just more importantly you're, you're going to have to have a written plan so i think most most everybody um the, the bigger companies are already already following suit because they probably already have work in in those states um like like we do here at garney so we're kind of ahead of head of the curve but um if you're not um i i would um get with uh Yasajara at the assp conference um in uh colorado last week i'm sure that was a lot of emphasis there in in communications but um yeah it's it's going to be rolling out real soon so um it's probably one of the bigger the bigger actionable items for a lot of companies right now for sure 
Absolutely. And you brought up a great point. I think that we'll also hear a lot about that at the, the National Safety Conference that, that will be coming up this next month as well. So again, if you guys need need free passes to that, um, please drop your name in the chat and we'll make sure that we get, get those to you. I want to thank all three of you. You've done a great job. Um, lots of great information. You guys have submitted some some awesome questions. We haven't gotten to all of them, um, but we will we will get back with you with some answers there. Um, there was just too many to get to today in, in this session. It's a huge topic, but we appreciate your attendance. If you haven't already, make for sure that you get signed up for our next event that's going to be this next month. Um, lots of good information that will be coming through, and we look forward to seeing you then. Thank you.